This is Democracy Now!, democracynow.org, The War and Peace Report. I'm Amy Goodman with Juan Gonzalez. Well, as NSA leaker Edward Snowden remains at a Moscow airport, uh, Army whistleblower Bradley Manning is on trial, and WikiLeaks founder Julian Assange is holed up in the Ecuadorian embassy in London. Today, we look at the strange story of another man tied to the world of cyber activism, who faces over 100 years in prison. His name is Barrett Brown. He's an investigative reporter with ties to the hacking collective Anonymous. He has spent the past 300 days in jail and has been denied bail. He faces 17 charges, ranging from threatening an FBI agent to credit card fraud uh, to, for posting a link online to a document that contains stolen credit card data. But according to his supporters, Brown is being unfairly targeted for daring to investigate the highly secretive world of private intelligence and military contractors. Before Brown's path crossed with the FBI, he frequently contributed to Vanity Fair, The Huffington Post, The Guardian, and other news outlets. In 2009, Brown created Project PM, which was, quote, dedicated to investigating private government contractors working in the secretive fields of cybersecurity, intelligence, and surveillance. He was particularly interested in the documents leaked by WikiLeaks and Anonymous. In the documentary We Are Legion, Barrett Brown explains the importance of information obtained by hackers. Some of the most important things that have been, uh, have had the most far-reaching influence and have been the most important in terms of what's been discovered, not just by anonymous, by, but by the media in the aftermath, is the result of hacking. That information can't be obtained by the traditional journalistic process, or it can't be obtained or won't be obtained by a congressional committee or a federal oversight committee. Uh, for the most part, that information has to be you know, obtained by hackers. In 2011, the group Anonymous hacked into the computer system of the private security firm H.B. Gary Federal and disclosed thousands of internal emails. Barrett Brown has not been accused of being involved in the hack, but he did read and analyze the documents, eventually crowdsourcing the effort through Project PM. One of the first things he discovered was a plan to tarnish the reputations of WikiLeaks and sympathetic journalist Glenn Greenwald of The Guardian. Brown similarly analyzed and wrote about the millions of internal company emails for Stratfor Global Intelligence that were leaked on Christmas Eve 2011. Shortly thereafter, the FBI acquired a warrant for Brown's laptop and authority to seize any information from his communications, or in journalism parlance, his sources. In September 2012, a troop of armed agents surged into Brown's apartment in Dallas, Texas, and handcuffed him face down on the floor. He's been in prison ever since. Well, for more, we're joined by Peter Ludlow, professor of philosophy at Northwestern University. He's written extensively on hacktivist actions against people, against private intelligence firms and the surveillance state. His recent article for The Nation is called The Strange Case of Barrett Brown. Uh, Peter Ludlow, welcome to Democracy uh, Now! Thank you very much. Uh, talk to us about Barrett Brown, the importance of his case, g given all the others that we've been dealing with on this show now for many years. Well, yeah, it's important for two reasons. First of all, it's showing that, to some extent, all of us could be targets, because the principal reasons that they're going after him with is this sort of uh, claim that he was involved in uh, credit card fraud or, or, or something like that. I mean, that's completely fallacious. I mean, in effect, what he did was take a link from a chat room and copied that link and pasted it into the chat room for Project PM. That is, he took a link that was broadcast widely on the Internet, and it was a link to the, the Strat for Hack information, and he just brought it to the attention of the editorial board of, of Project PM. And because there were, for whatever reason, unencrypted uh, credit card numbers and validation codes among those five million other emails, uh, the government is claiming that he was engaged in credit card fraud. They're claiming that Project PM uh, was a criminal enterprise. And so, basically, for our interest, what, why this is interesting to us is, is basically it makes it dangerous to even link to something or to share a link with someone. Right. Go ahead. Yeah, well, please. one of the things that you raise is, uh, in some of your writings on this is the uh, incestuous relationship between the Justice Department, the government, and these private uh, firms that, that are being now uh, targeted uh, by cyber activists. And uh, could you talk about that as well? 
Well, sure. A lot of these private intelligence companies are started by ex CIA, NSA people. Uh, some people come from those agencies and, and rotate back into the government. I mean, you even see with the case of Snowden, he was actually a, a contractor for a private intelligence company, Booz Allen. And uh, I mean, people think about the NSA, FBI, CIA, and they think of those are the people that are doing the surveillance of you and doing this intelligence work. But really, if you look at how much the United States spends on intelligence, 70% of that is actually going to these private intelligence contractors. So, you know, if you add up CIA, NSA, FBI, that's just a tip of the iceberg. So there's all this sort of spook stuff going on uh, in, in the private realm. And yeah, right, a lot of it is very incestuous, is a revolving door, and no one's investigating it or even talking about it as far as I Let's can tell. Let's go to Barrett Brown in his own words. In March 2012, Democracy Now! spoke with Barrett soon after his house was raided. On March 5th, I received a tip that I was about to be raided by the FBI. I left my apartment here in Dallas and went to my mom's residence here in the same city. Next morning, three FBI agents arrived at my mom's place. Uh, I went out and talked to them. They said my apartment had just been raided. The door was damaged. They would take care of that. And that uh, they also asked me if I had any laptops with me that I wanted to give them. I said no. Uh, a few hours later, the FBI returned uh, to my mom's house with another warrant, this time for her house, and detained the both of us uh, three hours while they searched the residence. They found several laptops I had stashed uh, somewhere in the house and left the search warrants uh, and uh, left another one in my apartment, which I got when I came back here uh, the uh, next day or so. Uh, the warrants themselves referred to uh, the information that they're seeking. Uh, as regarding uh, anonymous, of course, a few other things of that nature, and also two companies, HP Gary and Endgame Systems. Both of these are intelligence contracting companies that Anonymous uh, had a run-in with uh, in February of 2011, during which a number of emails were taken from HP Gary in particular, which themselves revealed a number of conspiracies being perpetuated by those companies in conjunction with the Justice Department and several other institutions, including Bank of America against WikiLeaks and against several journalists. Uh, the time since, I've spent a lot of time uh, going over those emails, researching them, conducting other research, and otherwise trying to expose a number of things that have been discovered by virtue of those emails from HP Gary having been taken. I sincerely believe that my activities on that front have contributed to me being raided the other day and will no doubt contribute to any further action that the FBI decides to take. I would just also note the Justice Department itself uh, is very much intertwined with this issue and has been for a while and in no way can conduct a fair investigation against me based on what I've revealed, what I've helped to sort of emphasize about them. Um, that was Barrett Brown in his own words just after the raid. Yeah. Um, Peter Ludlow, talk about what he had released. Talk about what he got from H.B. Gary and how this links to Glenn Greenwald. Sure. Well, what they uncovered was, I mean, it's actually a little bit subtle, right? It's because um, it begins with uh, the Bank of America being concerned that WikiLeaks had information on it. Bank of America goes to the United States Department of Justice. The Department of Justice leads them to Hunton and Williams, the big law fix-it firm in, in the D.C. area, who in turn hooks them up with a group of private intelligence contractors that went under the umbrella Team Themis. And Team Themis had a number of proposals and projects that, that uh, that were exposed in all of this. They included running kind of a PSYOPs operation against uh, the uh, Chamber Watch, which is a group that, that sort of uh, monitors the Chamber of Commerce, and it was an attempt to undermine it and Glenn Greenwald uh, and other individuals. And um, I mean, there were many, many plans that they had, many, many things, but some of the documents released showed that they were saying they were going to create fake documents, leak them to Greenwald, and then when Greenwald eventually released them, they would expose it as a fraud and attempt to undermine him in that way. And they had a similar plan for Chamber Watch and, as well. And their concern with Greenwald was that he was giving legit, that his defense of WikiLeaks was giving that was, uh, yeah. legitimacy to WikiLeaks. That was their concern. That, 
that was the concern, yeah. And they actually said in there, well, he's just a professional journalist and he'll fold under pressure immediately. I mean, apparently they were wrong about that, so yeah. There, there were also emails found uh, where these private security firms were assessing the damage that Jeremy Scahill's uh, books had done to uh, uh, to Blackwater? Well, actually, those I ran across that in the Stratfor leaks, and, and that was kind of interesting because they were monitoring um, they were monitoring this because they were concerned that Blackwater was going to get into the private intelligence business themselves. <laughs> and they were commenting on Scahill. They go, well, yeah, Scahill's, you know, I don't care much for his politics, but he's, he's really got these guys figured out, yeah. So that was a little compliment for Scahill, I think. Yeah. But, but the amazing thing in all of this is the, the degree to which these private security firms are in, in, engaging in attempts to uh, influence uh, what's going on in the public debate on uh, oh, uh, yeah. on intelligence. Oh, yeah, yeah. I mean, one of the, the most crazy things in the whole thing was when Coca-Cola approached Stratfor and they were concerned concerned about PETA, you know, People for the Ethical Treatment of Animals. And why, I'm not entirely sure, but uh, one of the people in Stratford said, well, the FBI has a, a classified file on PETA. I'll see if I can get it for you. Now, that little story sums up a lot of stuff that's wrong about this. First of all, why are private, why is Coca-Cola going to a private intelligence company for this? Why is why did the private intelligence company feel that they had immediate access to a classified file by the FBI? And why did the FBI have a classified file to begin with? I mean, but to me, the creepiest part of that very creepy little story is the fact that the guy at Stratfor felt that he had access to this classified file by the FBI. And the Barrett Brown case revealed something like this as well. It's almost like the FBI has become just another private security firm that it's become like a private cop for these companies, as it were. And I mean, that's part because of the revolving door. That's part because they get pressed into service for companies that want inside information on activist organizations like PETA. We're going to break yeah. and then come back to this conversation. We're talking to Peter Ludlow, professor of philosophy at Northwestern University, has written extensively on hacktivist actions against private intelligence firms. The piece he most recently wrote is for the nation, and it's called The Strange Case of Barrett Brown. When we come back, I want to ask you how it's possible he faces 100 years in prison. Yeah. It makes us think about Aaron Swartz. He didn't yeah. face anything like that, but he faced decades in prison. Yeah. He ultimately committed suicide yeah. before prosecution. Yeah. Stay with us.